This is Twit. What is? Yep. I think Mary Jo Foley must have taken over the show. What is no, Azure no. Sphere? Wait, wait till you hear what this is. You're going to be interested. This is brand new. I've never heard of it's this. It's brand new, and it's Linux. What? Yeah. So, uh, Microsoft. <sighs> This week is RSA. <laughs> this we week is RSA. Yep, and, we, were, we were there last night. Uh, yeah. Hanging at so RSA. Microsoft, yeah, they, they were like, okay, we have we have a couple news items that, um, that we're going to webcast. We're going to talk about it. So they started talking about things like Microsoft Score and all these kinds of things and then had rolled out some customers. And then at the end of their webcast, they said, by the way, we have this new thing called Azure Sphere. What? And yep. what it is is a is a – an operating system for microcontrollers. It's actually the silicon and a service in Azure for securing your IoT devices. Oh. Um, so it's a, it's basically what they are hoping will take off as a new way for people building IoT devices to manage and secure them through Azure. Oh, really um, interesting. Right. So this actually has roots in something that I wrote about a year ago and I think I even made it codename pick of the week on Windows Weekly called Project Sopris. Sopris was this work from Galen Hunt, who's a very famous Microsoft researcher and his team, to try to secure low-cost internet-connected devices. They were working with MediaTek. Um, they put out a, a bounty pr a program where they were trying to have people hack it and see if they could um, break into these devices, I think. And then suddenly, boom, they took Sopris code and they turned it into a product. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, they did that in a year. So it's it's out this week in private preview, they said. Uh, dev kits are coming by mid-year. And they think the first wave of Azure Sphere devices will be, quote, on shelves before the end of this calendar year. That is so it's really, it's interesting. It's almost a land yeah. grab. To say, mm -hmm. hey, we could we because they haven't really been a player in IoT up up to now. They've mm -hmm. been kind of a marginalized player. Well, Google's been completely dominant, and then to secondarily maybe Amazon, and then finally Apple, Microsoft. Yeah. I wouldn't have even put in the top three. I know. Well, they used to have this thing called Windows Embedded, which then became Windows 10 IoT. Um, but that's not really the same thing as microcontroller firmware, right? That's that's a different play. So that's is this more a like custom ASIC or who, who's making this chip? What's that all about? Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a system <laughs> on a chip. It's uh, the size of a fingernail, as you kept pointing out. It is arm based. Uh, more, it is arm based. It has, I believe, two arm cores: one for the OS, one for the app. Yep. Um, it is onboard uh, RAM storage, uh, networking, and S I/O. Secure enclave or anything like that. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. yep. Oh, okay. It's all every component is firewalled from each other. Oh. Um, oh, it's a whole security architecture. Um, it, MediaTek is the first company to make these ships. Uh, there will be many others, including Qualcomm, that will come on board hmm. uh, later. Um, there's a lot going on here. I mean, I, I, Boy, I just, no kidding. Talk, how did they make? Kind of, how did you not know about this? This is huge. Well, we kind of knew when we knew about Sopris, Sopris, right? We knew that, but we didn't know it was going to take off like this, right? I, like, I never would have attributed any importance to that. You know, not to this no. level. Um, but you know, you know, amazing. what's amazing. In the yeah. old days, something would be a Microsoft Research Project, and it might come out in like five years or never. And lately, something's a Microsoft Research Project, and boom, it's a product. They really have stepped that connection up a lot what's interesting about this to me personally is that because of what's gone on with windows and with terry myerson and everything I've, I've i've kind of written through my grief a little bit you know wrote a bunch of articles kind of analyzing what happened what's going to happen going forward and one of the things i kind of caught on to and i think we probably talked about this last week or maybe the week before is this notion that microsoft had admitted publicly it missed the mobile wave and it was looking for the next wave and it it kind of uh, it, at various times had said some silly things with the next wave. It talked about Windows Mixed Reality as the next wave at one point. It talked about uh, Windows 10 on ARM as the next wave. And those aren't waves, you know. Uh, for a wave of personal computing or a wave of computing is one that completely it's a tsunami. It destroys the thing that came before it. Um, mobile did that to the PC. What is big enough to do it to mobile? Right uh, to have that kind of exponential growth over what's 
possible in mobile. And it's this IoT stuff, of course. It's the ambient computing thing we were talking about previously. Um, when I spoke to, I spoke to several people from Microsoft over the week or two weeks after the Terry stuff. One of them said to me, uh, we have a security announcement coming up uh, on this day and you're going to want to pay attention to this. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> what is that? About? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I watched it, you know. Um, no, this is how it happened. This, so I was watching why. it. No, wait. I was watching it on the webcast and Paul, and then I said to Paul, are you watching this webcast? And he's like, no. Yeah. Uh, no, I said, like, I said, is that today? <laughs> Yeah, somebody, I'm like, you know, here's the link. You should probably take a look at it. We're both like, eh, Z, Well, no, I, Z, well, no I, as soon as you said that, I knew I had to watch it because I had been, yeah, you know, told, someone had said, right? there's something in there for you, you know? But it and, started uh, off so slow, right? And you're uh, just like, guy what from the Coke heck? is droning on and let's see about Coke stuff. And yeah, it was just like, it just partner things and kind yeah. of geeky one, uh, you know, giving a presentation, whatever. But um, then Brad Smith got up at the end and started talking about Azure Sphere and it was like, ding, 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 you know? Yep. <laughs> um, and he put some numbers to some of the things that I had sort of vaguely stated before. So I just mentioned, for example, that uh, IoT has the opportunity to completely engulf mobile from a uh, unit perspective. And he, what he said was that this past year, 9 billion of this type of device, not as sophisticated as the one that Microsoft's making, but this style of IoT device, uh, 9 billion of them shipped last year. You can compare that to, I guess, 1.5 billion phones that ship in a year, 250 million PCs. And it gives you that that upward trajectory. Now, that's potential, right? Because obviously none of those devices are capable of running this software solution. But, um, you know, this is, it's potentially revolutionary what they're doing. And I think it does speak to this next wave concept. I think this is Microsoft firmly... Establishing, establishing that this is it, and this is the strength of Microsoft in in the cloud, brought down to a client that makes tons of sense, high volume, uh, low margin kind of business, obviously. Um, and it's that I think we talked about this just last week: intelligent cloud and intelligent edge. This is all of that. That this triangle of uh, things they put in the Azure Sphere uh, platform all speak to those two things. Mm-hmm. If you look in the show notes, I put I have Paul put a picture in there that I found because I saw a lot of people saying, why didn't they use Windows in these microcontrollers? Like, why did they use Linux? And I, believe it or not, in, in a previous life, before I started covering Windows, I used to cover real-time <laughs> embedded operating systems. Yeah, I had an exciting <laughs> career back As, then. You know what, and I think I, everyone is not surprised to hear that. No, and so they call her the queen of our toss. <laughs> the queen our of toss, <laughs> our toss, baby. It's a thing, and <laughs> that. So, if you look at this picture, which is from an EE Times um, survey that they do in conjunction with, I think it's called uh, Aspen Con or something. Uh, they talk about what what are people using as their real time embedded operating systems. Number one, embedded Linux, like by a long shot, right? Windows is in there, but it's like down the list yeah, and there's other things like free toss and android and debian it's right? actually this by is the way sorry to interrupt it's it's worse than you're indicating in a way because a lot of those other things are android, linux debian linux. ubuntu are <laughs> yeah. linux yeah kernels, if you right. add debian and ubuntu linux. that's another 24 percent making 46 exactly. percent add android yeah. which isn't yeah. i mean it's kind of linux but uh, yeah but if you but that's well over 50 percent so right yeah. yeah and and windows is eight percent yeah. <laughs> right. I'm surprised it's even that high, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. yeah. So um, with regards to this data, I had asked Microsoft about why they chose Linux, because a lot of people were saying they had done so for security reasons. And they said, no, that's not that's not the case. And it is this thing, you know, in other words, what, what makes Linux so good for this kind of thing? And I think it just has to do, it's sort of like the reverse of scale. You know, it's the, the notion that something big and heavy like Windows, it's hard to kind of componentize and get that down small enough where it makes sense on a truly embedded system. They've tried, I mean, for literally for decades to make it happen. Um, but Linux, for whatever reason, is just architected in such a way that it works efficiently on this kind of thing. It is, I think this these kinds of markets has become up through like uh, networking switches and whatever else. Um, it kind of spoke to this notion of we're not, we don't, nobody wants to pay a license on every one of these things. We want to build it and go, you know. Yeah. And I think Linux just, it just works out. But to put, kind of put numbers to it, if I can find this. Um, the side, yeah. So the Windows IoT, Windows 10 IoT, which is the latest version of Microsoft's embedded operating system, requires 100 times the power 
of the MCU that is in Azure Sphere. And the M the uh, the MPU that is in Azure Sphere, this one I'm going to get wrong, I apologize, is I, it was either two or five times more powerful than the MCUs that are, uh, I'm sorry, MCU or MPU? MCU. I think it's MCU. Then the micro, the micro control the units. Master micro, control unit. Master yeah, control. That are in um, current solutions of this kind. So yep. Windows 10 IoT is is somewhere on the order of two to 500 times bigger, you know, for lack of a better term, um, mm -hmm. or requires maybe two to five Ton, two to 500 times, not two to five times, two to 500 times, <laughs> 200 to 500 times, the yeah. uh, computing resources that are available in that kind of a system. And there, you, that's why. That's mm -hmm. that's all you need to yeah. know right there. It's just yep. Windows is too big and heavy It's not, you know, to, to be used in this kind of application. Right. I went into the Microsoft documentation for Windows 10 IoT Core to see what kinds of jobs they're recommending that for. So they're not recommending it for microcontrollers. It says this is for things like small per, small footprint purpose built devices like gateways with yep. or without displays, right? So that's where they see that playing. It's not on a microcontroller that's going to be embedded in a sensor or something oh, can build, like that. If you want, I have a few other device types if, yep. it, if it helps build it yep. up a little bit. ATM machines, uh, point of sale right. devices, digital yep. signs and media players, kiosks, Smart thermostats, robots, wearables, you know, kind of go, and then et, et, mm -hmm. et cetera is the last one. <laughs> but it's a, it's <laughs> kind of a, yes. it's, it's a, it's a level <laughs> above what these things are. You know, Brad, yeah. uh, I want to call him Brad Sams for some reason. Brad Smith um, repeatedly referred to the notion that, what? Yep. <laughs> that these <laughs> chips <Brad> Smith. <laughs> would be used in toys, right? Um, yeah. And one of the things I think that's, and this is, again, this is a market I, I can't claim to understand, um, but the market for this these kind of tiny little embedded controllers, I think one of the key differentiators between Microsoft is, well, actually, let's say there are three that I can think of. Uh, one is the security component, obviously, integrated into the entire platform. Um, the other one is just the processing power, which, again, I can't remember the figure, but two to five times what's available in today's MCUs. And the th third one, I'm losing track of my mind here. <laughs> what was the third <laughs> one? God damn it. Uh, oh, is connectivity. Um, connectivity is not an assumption in these devices. I'm sure some of them do have connectivity. Uh, the first gen devices have uh, integrated Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, they, they were very specific that that's what's there in the first ones, which lends me or leads me to think that maybe there'll be other forms of communication offered in future versions as well. Mm-hmm. It was a real brain fart there. Sorry. <laughs> I knew <laughs> yeah, there was a third well, one. <laughs> one of the funny things on the webcast too was it, I think Microsoft wanted to create this thunder around this being Linux based, right? So uh, yeah. I forget the name of the woman who presented with Brad Smith, um, but she, after they announced it, she said to the I people know. who are in the live audience, guys, did you hear like, this is Linux. Anybody, anybody surprised by that? And the room was just quiet. It was just, yeah, I, I don't even know what the audience was to this thing. I can assure you <laughs> the reaction would have been different in different audience types. Maybe, you know? except, you know what? I wasn't surprised. And, and I think that speaks to how Microsoft has changed for one thing, because now you get yeah. these Linux announcements and, you know, maybe even a year ago we would be like, wow, it was Linux. I just was like, okay, it's Linux. We uh, we are, we are treated as be, being part of the Microsoft sphere, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Uh, we are treated to the recurring story, the Groundhog Day that is our existence of Microsoft <laughs> just embrace Linux. Yeah, and they right. didn't just embrace Linux. No, they've been doing it for years, yeah. and every time it happens, we it, it's like we have to pretend it's something new. And right. I and I agree <laughs> that we're we're kind of at the point now where we shouldn't be surprised by something like this. The only thing I'll the caveat to that is just. Literally, what was it, two weeks ago, they just mm -hmm. demoted Windows. And now, right now, they're announcing their first Linux, the first Linux that they've made that they will distribute to other people. Mm -hmm. um, it, the timing is probably just coincidental, but it, it, it that made it a little weird for me, at least. Yeah. 